seeing that I wasn't going to probably get the, the engine burn out around the engine, um, I made the decision on foot to make it to the safety zone. By the time I came around the corner, the whole flame front came up the hill when I was in the middle of the saddle with the truck. So I saw all the heat hit right there. <clears throat> that's when it, it cinched all the back of my hair off <laughs> stuff right there. So that's when I was just trying to keep up with him. My goal was to fire out as I went along the two track to try to create a buffer. I'll have a, a, enough black where we can actually, um, you know, won't take a lot of heat. Trent was trying to, my engine boss, he was trying to give me some advice over the radio. I think at one point I told him, hey, Trent, I can't talk to you right now. I've got to, I'm, I got to focus on trying to better the situation. I tried lighting something on the back end of the saddle so that I could literally just with the wind so that I could create a big black kind of wag dodge style, uh, create an escape fire. That's when I told Austin, I said, all right, we need to drop this pack. It's, our packs are just weighing us down. Um, I said, grab your fire shelter, grab, grab, keep your tool with you. We need to make a run for it out of this saddle. As soon as I took that off and just was holding a fire shelter, a fusee and shovel and my radio, it was considerably lighter and I was able to move considerably faster. So I just dropped everything. By that time, it was all hot. My helmet blew off my head, went down the hill. I just, I dropped my tool, everything, dropped my pack. So I just took my shelter out and uh, so did he. It was so hot while we were running. I, I just remember holding that shelter and that plastic on there was getting soft and sticky on my fingers <laughs> while we were running. And so that's like a lot of the burns on my hands and stuff. That's because I was like this and the fire was on this side and it was just getting sticky. And so that's why it's important to wear your gloves. We got to about where the knob was and we were taking a lot of heat. And I made the decision that we needed to deploy our shelter. I called back to my engine to inform them that we had now got roughly six spots and we were going to come out. And at that point, the division in charge came over the radio as we were heading up to our engine that all units needed to get to their safety zones and disengage. At that point, we were making our way out. And when I looked to the road, roughly 50 feet away, crown fire rolling down towards the road and I informed them that we were not going to make it to them and we headed down to the two track to run out and as we were headed out to the east it was blowing across about four foot flame lanes across the two track that we weren't going to run through so we turned back around to go back and we were cut off from that and we wound up passing this lush green meadow like three times while we were down there and made the decision that this was not going to burn this was a survivable area and at that point the column collapsed on us and you couldn't see about five feet in front of you we tried to escape three out of four different directions and got cut off each time and at that point it was it was pretty much a no-go anymore because we were just in a horseshoe of fire and it was time to just ride this one out in the survivable spot we had spots all around us hey let's go i remember Division saying let's go. I remember ops saying let's go. We bug out. There's fire behind us now. It's moving. Got a call from Robert. And he said, well, you can't come to the upper safety zone because I just drove through fire to get here. He said, I advise that you use the alternate escape route. I call operations. I said, do we have anybody that is on that alternate escape route that can tell me what it's like, if is it compromised, because there's a big column coming off the of Delta. So our primary up the canyon where the spot fire was at's gone. Our secondary to the, the safety zone that I had punched in before was done, and our alternate's done. Let's get to a spot that I'd found the day before. A parking area is what I really looked at it for. And old division got on a red and says, well, I'm gonna order up a type three helicopter to fly in and land you. Because I, th I think you could land them there. And, and I, did told, I told him, no, you're not bringing a Type 3 in here because now we're going to have an aircraft mishap. And at this point, we got four to six foot flame links all the way underneath us. And that's when I turned and I grabbed Josh and I said, we gotta make a run for it now. Get rid of your torch, we're running for it. I pulled the, his radio out of his chest harness and I called operations, told him we've been cut off, we gotta make a run for it. 
That was the only transmission I made. And at that point in time, I thought our best chance was going for the finger with two foot flame links through the grass. I didn't want to stay in this timber patch. I knew that. And I could tell that whatever is coming up out of the canyon wasn't going to be a good place to be either. And I felt that there was way too much heat to retreat this way and I didn't want to go through this heat. I could see this there was a good straight shot and we start running and as we come out you know we're at a, a good jog and the wind's starting to pick up a bit. I'm moving at a good good pace but not a dead sprint. And I'm keeping I keep trying to look for a hole where we could try to sneak through somewhere in here and it wasn't evident where there was a spot. I feel a really strong downburst and I grabbed Josh by the shirt collar and I told him we gotta hold up, we gotta see what it's gonna do. I didn't even get the words out of my mouth. Uh, instantly this is now 30 foot flame links laid running at us. And I just did a quick scan, turned around and just about where this tree is right here, there's four to six foot flames. And I told him that's where we're going, we gotta run through it. And at this point, it's a dead sprint. I mean, this is chasing us as quick as we're moving. Once we come through it, uh, you know, to me, it was dark, extremely smoky. Neither one of us received any heat injuries running through the, the fire that we got into to get into this black. Um. Immediately when we got to this point, we dropped packs, everybody started gearing up, getting in full PPE, and uh, realizing that we were engaged with the fire even though we didn't know it yet. So, As soon as the fire turned and started to line up with the canyon coming down, we could see spot fires starting between us and the head of the fire, and they were, they were starting to torch rather quickly. And not long after that, uh, the, the senior packer was seen chasing his horses down the trail, all the pack animals down the trail. The rodeo in this situation was pretty chaotic. It caused a lot of chaos. It kept people, it got people distracted from the main idea of getting down and moving down the trail. We basically helped the Wrangler get all his mules in front of us and he started moving back down the trail. And after they started moving down the trail, at this point the fire was on us. Spots, fires all around us, you could feel the heat and we, we, were almost, we were all together, spread out maybe within 20 yards of each other. We started moving down the trail a little bit more. Myself, I was going through my head trying to figure out, should I stay on that trail and run? Because it was a decent trail. It was a river grade down to the Jack Creek Trailhead. But my decision was made when a crew member came up and asked, what should we do? I'm going to stick with you, Jordan. And right then, I felt that I had a responsibility of another crew member, and breaking away from the crew was going to get caused probably more confusion. Maybe some people were going to wonder what was going on. And so with that, in my mind, I was thinking, I got to stay with the crew, try to keep everybody together, keep people less freaked out. As I'm running along, I'm kind of in the very back, all of a sudden I see a pack laying on the ground. And that's when it really starts to dawn on me that we're we're trapped and we're going to have to do something. Somebody else has already thought about it, that it's, it's time to find a deployment site. Um, at this point, we crossed the river because the fire was on our right side and the only cool place at this time was on the opposite side of the river. Started running down to the Anderson Creek Junction because we knew that was our last place that we saw a viable option. For I remember um, it just getting really loud and calling for um, my, my supervisor, my, my operator, and uh, my crew members, hey, you know, get out, get out, let's get back to the pond, get back to the pond. But um, it just didn't seem like I was screaming. It seemed like I was talking very low. And th the noise was just so loud, I, I couldn't um, hear myself. That's when I think I realized this is a little bit bigger than, than what I thought it was. Um, I looked around real quick to see if I could make a, a run for the, uh, the bridge and then realized, well, no, it's coming from that area and uh, realized, well, I need to make a decision on where I'm gonna go, because nobody's coming towards me, nobody's going towards the pond yet. And then I kind of felt everybody coming in the same direction. So I'm, I'm trying to run towards the pond and dragging my pack and pull out the, uh, 
the shelter at the same time and, and I realized, well, I better do one thing at a time or so. I stopped for a second, opened up the pack and uh, looked over to make sure I was still going in the right direction of the pond. And I was, I was fumbling for my, uh, my shelter. Somebody brushed by me and I realized, okay, maybe I should get in the water now versus uh, try to deploy the shelter here. So I'm about ankle deep in the water and people are starting to come towards the water and getting in the water. And uh, I just remember looking up to see uh, how bad it was and everything was red. It seemed like it, the treetops were red. Um, no matter what, which direction I looked in, it just seemed like this wasn't getting any better. It was getting a lot worse. So at that point, I think I just kind of threw myself in the water. Just too late by that time. By the time we got it clamped and everything, it was already starting to run in the canopy. And I mean, there wasn't pretty much enough, enough water to do any damage. So uh, it started going lateral in the canopy. And uh, I wasn't too sure if those guys knew exactly if there was a pond. So I remember telling them, get to the effing pond. This crap's about to blow up, whatever. I don't know the exact words, but it was roughly like that. Um, and so we went back and I was always, they always tell us, you know, try, try to grab the hose when you come back, save the brass. So I remember grabbing the hose, but it was wrapped around a tree somehow when I went back. So I just dropped it and left it. Like I remember out of the corner of my eyes, I was running. I could see it sheeting like across the canopy, like on my right. It was like right there. And then it got caught up for a little bit right when we got to the pond. I don't know if there was, I don't remember the site too well, but I don't know if there was enough, uh, feel right there, but it ended up spotting over to the other trees. But it was, I mean, it was on our on our butts. I mean, enough to where one of the guys, I think he was, he took like a minor, minor burn to the back, like a blister kind of. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was moving. The three guys that came from the other engine were kind of just hesitant about getting in the pond. And I was just, you know, got to the pond. I was already knee deep trying to get my shelter out. And I was telling, yelling at them, get in the pond, get in the pond. And uh, I just remember right before I went under the water, it was coming, pretty, you know, right over our heads. 